These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. Last week, I told you about the peak of the Akkadian Empire, the King Naram Sin, and his many victories and innovations. He conquered more than his grandfather had, built bigger and systematized more, though he already had a strong foundation to build off of. Thus, it is a fair question for a modern scholar to wonder whether Sargon or Naram Sin was the greater king. And from our perspective, good arguments can be made in either direction. But from the standpoint of the ancients, even a mere century after Naram Sin's death, this was not a question at all. For the Babylonians, Assyrians, Hittites, and other Bronze and Iron Age Near Easterners, Sargon was unquestionably the superior king. And this wasn't because of some minor detail either. A Babylonian or Hittite would have looked at you funny for even asking this question. For them, Naram Sin was no heroic god king. He was a failure, a coward, and a blasphemer. This was the result of a dedicated campaign following Naram Sin's death by the enemies of Akkad to defame the monarch by rewriting his inscriptions to be the opposite of how they had originally been. And so the inscription that boasts of him winning nine battles in a single year is rewritten by later copyists to be nine defeats in a single year. And imaginary inscriptions are invented that mix the language of his actual inscriptions, but invent new military defeats with preposterously large casualty counts. Add to this the perception that Naram Sin had sinned against the gods, and a whole host of legends arose in the centuries after he could no longer defend himself, eventually coalescing into two principal works of myth, the Cathayan legend and the curse of a god. I'm going to tell both of these stories here today, but I want you to remember, as I do, that both of them present an image of Naram Sin so drastically divorced from the historical man that it's really nothing but slanderous. Still, these fictions are how history remembered Naram Sin, or at least until his entire civilization was forgotten by the Christian era, and they serve as telling windows into the values of the Middle and Later Bronze Age by telling us what is not desirable in a ruler. We'll begin with the Cathayan legend, a tale which arises from the deliberately distorted victory texts and continues to evolve until its final form in the late Hittite period, past the Bronze Age and even into the Iron Age. As a result, we're going to see gods that won't be properly introduced until we get further along the timeline, though I think we'll be seeing the major ones soon enough as we enter the Babylonian period. The legend begins. Tupsen napitem manara shtasi, sha anakus naram sin maar sharukin, ishturum ma elzibushu anaum mesati. Open the tablet box and read out the stella, which I, Naram Sin, son of Sargon, have inscribed and left for future days. Grandfather Sargon departed this life, then my father Manishtashu departed this life, and I, Naram Sin, became ruler of this land. As the days and years went by, it seems the goddess Ishtar changed her plan after having ordained prosperity for Akkad. Seeing this change in fortune, I question the great gods, Ishtar, Baba, Zababa, An, Nabu, and Shamash, and note already that the listing of the great gods already reflects much later cult practice. Naram Sin summons the oracles, who sacrifice fourteen lambs in a fortune-telling ritual, and reads out their entrails. We have no idea what the oracles said, that section of the story is too damaged to read, but it was surely bad news, because when the story picks back up, they're telling a warning story of old King Enmerkar of Uruk, saying, Do you recall the great King Enmerkar? When he was faced with an enemy horde, he thought with his weapon, not with his brains or piety, and also forgot to write down a commemorative stella about his deeds. And because of that, he's condemned in the afterlife, as well as the ghosts of his ancestors, to suffer and drink dirty water. Meanwhile, 
As Naram Sin is receiving this obscure but surely dark oracle, the goddess Tiamat, of whom we will be hearing much more in Babylonian times, has given birth to a race of monsters, with the bodies of bats and faces of ravens. They are suckled by their mother Tiamat and blessed by Belit Ili, another god of later times. They grow in the mountains until they number 360,000 strong. They're led by eight kings, a father and his seven sons. And the father is named Anubanini, suggesting that they're meant to be stand-ins for the lullaby barbarians who had a historical king with the same name. Though likely they are meant to be mythical allegories for all the mountain barbarians who threaten Mesopotamia just in general. These beasts, the Uman Manda, appear in Anatolia and begin to plunder. They're approached by an Akkadian officer, but that officer gets beaten up for his trouble. They move from there to Subartu, Armenia, and the northern seas. They then destroy Gutium and Elam, and off then to crush Dilmun, Magan, and Meluha. At this point, the whole world, at least the parts that still survive, are in a panic, and 17 kings have brought 90,000 troops to Naram Sin's capital, begging for assistance. But at this point, People still don't even know what's going on. So Naram Sin sends a soldier with a spear, ordering him to prick one of the enemies and see if it bleeds to determine if these are even enemies which can be fought. The soldier returns with happy news. The monsters do bleed. They're not invincible ghosts. And so again, Naram Sin calls the seers down, and again, they have a sacrifice. The gods are clearer this time, explicitly forbidding him from launching a campaign against these monsters. Well, Naram Sin was enraged, shouting, What lion ever observed oracles? What wolf ever had his dreams read? I will go like a robber on my own inclination, and I will return with plunder from their bodies. And he organized an army of 120,000 men, the finest that Akkad had to offer, resplendent in polished copper and bronze, a long line of spearmen, followed by a heavy cadre of archers. And the whole thing accompanied by perhaps twice that number of camp followers, supply carts, and military hangers-on. But Naram Sin himself stays behind. I'm not actually sure if this is part of the slander, in Akkadian times, it would be a mark of rank cowardice for the king not to accompany his men on a major campaign. And so they could simply be calling him a coward here, something which will definitely happen much more explicitly a bit later. But it could also simply be a reflection of later kingship, the time during which this story was written. Since in later times, it would not always be mandatory for a king to lead an army personally, and it would in fact be part of the mystique of Sargon, that back in those days, every king was a great warrior. In any case, it is narratively necessary for Naram Sin to stay behind, because of the 120,000 men he sends against the army of monsters three times their size, not a single one survives. The next year, he tries again, but since the cream of Akkad soldiers have already been slain, he's only able to muster up 90,000 men. The scene is much the same, and the result is equally grim. The third year, he's able to find only 60,700 soldiers, since it may be the end of the world, but these monsters have already slain every single man to face them, so volunteers are notably thin on the ground. This army, as well, is lost to a man. When Naram Sin hears the news of the latest expedition, he's bewildered, confused, sorrowful, and most of all, exhausted. He monologues despondently, asking, What do I have to show for my reign? I'm a king who brings no prosperity to his country. What should I do? And as he's paralyzed by fear, horror falls upon a cad. Night, death, pestilence, drought, terror, frost, hunger, famine, and misfortune of every kind falls on them. And somehow, even though they receive a drought from the gods, they also get hit by floods in the city and ruining the fields. But the god Ea, lord of wisdom and creation, is always a friend to humanity and takes pity 
on Naram Sim, urging the gods to give him another chance. And so on the next New Year's festival, under instructions from Ea, Naram Sin makes offerings to the gods and again consults the oracles. Again, the contents of the oracular reading are damaged to the point of illegibility, but this one appears to be more favorable. So the king assembles a fourth army, this one with himself at the head. He's able to catch an isolated group of enemy monster men away from the main host, and overwhelmed, a dozen of them flee, but Naram Sin is able to catch them and take them prisoner. But now he's extra cautious about the will of the gods, as well he should be, and so he says he will take no action with these prisoners until he has consulted the gods. But when he calls up the oracle, the gods scream at him, saying he must stop at once and not destroy these monsters. Finally, the gods reveal the purpose of these horrible creatures. Some day, they explain, Enlil, king of the gods, will summon them for evil works. When Enlil grows angry, he will set them upon a city and burn the buildings. The inhabitants of the city will pour out blood, the earth will grow barren, the date palms will wither, and when the land is overrun, city will fight city, brother with brother, and no one will speak truth to each other. That city, the target of Enlil's wrath, will then be captured by an enemy city. Take note of this prophecy, since being written hundreds of years after the events, it wasn't really a prophecy at all, but a dramatic depiction of events during the coming fall of Akkad. Basically, the gods are saying, stop attacking our divine army. It will be set against some foe that angers the gods in later days. But it turns out, as the audience would surely have been aware, that in later days it will be Akkad itself that the gods set this army on. But Naram Sin doesn't know this. All he knows is that he needs to stop challenging the gods in his massive hubris. And so he did not bring death to his twelve monstrous prisoners. Instead, Naram Sin recorded all these events on an ivory tablet for future generations to reference, and placed it in the temple of the plague god Nurgle in the city of Kutha, hence the name the Cuthaean legend. At the end, Naram Sin exhorts the reader to listen carefully to his words. His advice to all who come after him is to live in peace behind strong city walls, focusing on your harvest and your family. Do not fear or struggle, just accept the will of the gods. Tie up your weapons and put them in a corner to gather dust, restraining your valor. And if a wanderer comes through your field, trespassing and murdering your cattle and eating the beef, don't attack him. Rather, respond to this wickedness with meekness and kindness, and even offer him more gifts from your land. These last words in particular are so alien to the historical character of Naram Sin as to be comical. At no point in the Bronze Age would this Buddhist or Christ-like benevolence have been seen as anything but the most base and cowardly of character defects. And putting these words in Naram Sin's mouth is not a means of showing him to be some sort of humanitarian, but a way of mocking him as a weak and worthless man. And this is one of the most popular tales of Akkad to be told in later eras, at least to judge by the number of surviving copies. It's not clear to me why later generations despised Naram Sin so deeply. Curiously, neither this nor his next legend mention his self-deification directly. Perhaps it is what is meant by references to his hubris. Perhaps they hated him as a symbol of Akkadian oppression where they came to view his grandfather as the symbol of Akkadian glory and process, an understandable enough move for the culture to take in order to untangle the positives and negatives aspects of the empire among the dominated peoples. Perhaps later kings were jealous because they found themselves unable to match him, though if this was the case, why wasn't Sargon slandered in the same way? And finally, Perhaps when later generations would look back at the Akkadian Empire as a Mesopotamian Golden Age, they grew genuinely upset with Naram Sin for causing the empire to fall. But from our point of view, this last is irrational, since it clearly isn't Naram Sin's fault that the empire fell. 
Indeed, as he perished, he left the empire in the strongest state it would ever see. Indeed, the myriad reasons for the coming collapse will be discussed in the next episode, but suffice it to say that as far as modern historians are concerned, Akkad collapses despite, not because of, Naram Sin. However, these facts were simply unknown to the ancients, having been replaced very quickly by a new story of Naram Sin, another work of immense popularity during the Bronze Age. The Curse of Agata is already extant and fairly common by 2100, a mere century following his death and perhaps mere decades after the actual destruction of the city of Akkad. However, it is what became the dominant narrative that formed everyone's opinion on poor, slandered Naram Sin until the Akkadian Empire was forgotten and rediscovered again in the modern age. The tale begins with Enlil, god of kings, recounting how his displeasure had slain Kish and Uruk and given command of the entire world to Sargon and the city of Akkad. Goddess Ishtar had so favored the kings of this dynasty that she had even taken up residence in Akkad and possibly engaged in ceremonial marriage with the kings of Akkad. She spent all her time bringing divine favor to her new city, ensuring that the people all had splendid food, drink, and public spaces. Even foreigners were welcome at these lavish tables, including tributaries from as far away as Marhashi, and the gardens had exotic animals like monkeys, elephants, and water buffalo. Ishtar filled the granaries with gold and precious gems. How did anyone eat? I'm not sure. Don't ask these questions. She endowed the old women with wisdom, the old men with eloquence, the young women with beauty, and the young men with martial valor and she gave to the little children joy. Note here the ranking of virtues according to each person and station in life according to the Bronze Age Akkadians. Drums and flutes and zamzam instruments played all day, and the harbors were full of ships and merrymaking. Everything was good. Then a new king arose like the daylight, Naram Sin, and for a while things were good. The agriculture of the lands were prosperous, and the subject peoples who did not know agriculture had their own prosperity. From distant lands, trade flowed freely, and the accountants measured so many rich offerings that the gods even became weary of them. But then there was troubling news from the Temple of Enlil, the Ekur in Nippur, the chief among temples in Mesopotamian religion. And with Enlil's displeasure, the other gods quickly abandoned the city of Akkad, each taking their gifts with them. With Ishtar's departure, the weapons of war were made feeble. With Ninurta went the symbols of rulership. With Shamash left eloquence. With Ea left wisdom. And with all the cities watching, the glory of Akkad was brought low. No more could Naram Sin bring victory or glory to the city. And to reiterate at this point, there was no point historically that matches this change in fortune under Naram Sin. It is nothing but a slander, or at best, him being confused with future kings under whom the empire really did start to crumble. Anyway, Naram Sin began to receive prophetic visions from the gods, saying that he had lost divine favor, and that the treasures of Akkad were going to be scattered to the winds. And so Naram Sin gave away his worldly wealth and went into a show of mourning and contrition until the gods forgave him for his trespass. The precise failing of Naram Sin is not mentioned, but without context, it almost seems like Enlil is being super arbitrary here. However, given the cultural context, it is likely that he is meant to be suffering for his declaration of his own godhood. For seven years, he buries his head in his hands, a scandalous display that shocks the writer of this tale. Then he gave up on his display and tried to communicate with the gods directly, sacrificing a goat to perform an oracle. Naram Sin wanted to make a deal that he would build Enlil a great temple if Enlil would lift this curse. But the gods were silent to this communication. Naram Sin tried a second time, and still the gods denied him. But in his blasphemous arrogance, he altered this second pronouncement from the god. 
With this forged oracle, he gathered his labor levy together and set them to the Ekur, where they proceeded with great detail and violence to tear the old temple apart. He ripped off drain pipes, and all the rain stopped falling on the land. He changed the schedule of grain shipments, and no more grain grew in the land. He struck the gate of well-being, and well-being was subverted in the land. The list of blasphemies he committed against the temple is long and total. This act is the kernel of truth in the story. Figuratively speaking, by proclaiming himself a god, Naram Sin torn down the edifice of Sumerian religion in the eyes of those who considered it high blasphemy. And literally speaking, Naram Sin ended up tearing down quite a lot of the Ekur, though he did this in the process of rebuilding it as mentioned last episode. The rebuilding isn't mentioned in this legend, though, just the tearing down. Though again, it could be argued that rebuilding and consecrating under the eye of a man who proclaimed himself a god doesn't really count as being properly sanctified. In any case, the one who really matters here was unhappy. And Enlil, the roaring storm that subjugates the entire land, the rising deluge that cannot be confronted, was considering what should be destroyed in return for the wrecking of his temple. He looked up to the Gubin Mountains and forced the inhabitants, the Gutians, to descend. The Gutians were barbarians, with human intelligence but dog-like mannerisms and the faces of monkeys. Like a plague of small birds, they swooped down to the lowlands and made havoc in the civilized lands. The messengers no longer trusted the highways. The animals were all driven out of their pastures and the farmlands were destroyed. The cities were all separated from each other, each crying out from behind their walls, but with no one to come to their aid. The prices of goods shot up to extortionate levels. A shekel of grain would only purchase half a liter, and the people began to attack each other in the streets from hunger. Starving, feral dogs roamed the alleys in such desperate numbers that even if three strong men together confronted them, the men would still be pulled down by the dogs and eaten. Honest people were taken to be traitors, heroes lay dead atop heroes, and the blood of traitors ran upon the blood of honest men. In isolated farms and villages, the great temple of Enlil was replaced by those who rejected Naram Sin with small reed sanctuaries, humble but pious structures, and those who survived those days spent all their time in wailing and lamentation. The people begged and pleaded Enlil and gave him deep worship, and so finally Enlil was convinced to cease his destruction and go take a nap. But that isn't the end of it, since the other major gods see Enlil's exhaustion and decide to pick up the slack for him. Literally, the entire rest of the text is nothing but spitting curses on a cad, and it gets so fervent that the writer at some point even forgets to put these curses in the mouth of the gods, and just lists out all the things he wants to happen to a cad. And given that this is likely written after the historical destruction of the city, the things that probably did happen to a cad. To give a sense of it, the curses run like this. In this city, may the heads fill the wells. May brother not recognize brother. May the young women be murdered in their own homes and the old men mourn their dead wives. May the pigeons moan on window ledges and the small birds die in small nooks. May the whole city live in constant anxiety like a timid bird. May your wall resound with mourning. May your statues crumble to dust. May your clay be returned to the earth and cursed. May your grain and wood be cursed. May the butcher slaughter his own wife and child. May the poor of the city drown in the river. May the prostitute hang herself over her brothel. May all the pregnant women abort their babies. May the gold, silver, and copper become as worthless as lead. A cad. May your men be without strength. 
strength, unable to lift his own provisions and lay idle all day. May the city die of hunger. All the citizens who eat fine foods should eat the coating of their roofs and the leather hinges on their father's house. May depression hang over the once joyous public spaces. May the evils of the desert and the silent places howl continuously. Birds will nest in your gatehouses. Grass will choke the canals and highways will crumble and only brackish water will flow through the city. If someone desires to dwell in this city, they will not find a good place to dwell. And if someone desires to rest in this city, they will find no rest there. Ishtar be praised for the destruction of Akkad. There exists a genre called Lamentations in the Sumerian literature in which the destruction of a city is mourned by the author with heavy religious overtones. Indeed, this was such a popular genre that it was even adopted in later traditions, such as the Old Testament Book of Lamentations. The Curse of a God is a subversion of that genre, reveling in the utter destruction of a hated city, while still following the forms of so-called Naru literature. From a literary perspective, it was considered by later peoples to be one of the stylistically best cuneiform works, and of course the moral lesson, don't anger the gods and despoil the temples, was unimpeachable as far as the temple-trained scribes were concerned. From an historical perspective, it is impossible to tell how much of this was actually witnessed during or after the fall of the city, and how much was simply vengeful fantasy. But it's interesting to note that certain of the particular details are definitely things seen in times of hardship. Scenes like runaway inflation as prices spiral upwards, and the depiction of men eating anything at all, including leather and roof reeds, are images common to every truly desperate famine in world history, from the ancient Chinese sieges to the modern Holodomor. And the vivid picture of overgrown roads and weed-choked canals suggests as well eyewitness accounts of the ruined city. But most interesting is that None of these things come about on their own. Akkad would never have fallen to merely natural forces, at least according to the Sumerians and Akkadians, because in their world view, there was no such thing as secular history. They believed the world to be static, continuing on in current form as far forward or back as one cared to look in time. The only thing for them that could bring large-scale change to the world was direct intervention by the gods, which explains why, despite all the evidence that Naram Sin brought unparalleled prosperity to Akkad, he is the one to blame for its collapse. He was, after all, the great blasphemer in the eyes of later writers, and the idea of kingly self-deification would continue to be deeply controversial in the next historical era. Still, for a modern person, the idea that a god, especially the now forgotten Sumerian gods, caused the collapse of the Akkadian Empire is deeply unsatisfactory. And so next week we're going to take a proper scientific look at the multiple factors that actually combined to bring down the world's first empire. So join me next time as we discuss weak kings, dark ages, climate change, and foreign invasion. Thank you for listening.